may also be evaluated as sound or unsound. An argument is sound if it is formally valid and its premises are all true. An argument is unsound if it is formally valid, but at least one of its premises is false. Informal logic is concerned with all of the ways in which an argument might be unsound. As we have seen, arguments are composed of premises and a conclusion, where the premises are said to support, prove, or provide evidence for the conclusion. There are difficulties in identifying arguments. Not everything that is written contains an argument. In fact, most writing does not contain arguments. Quite often, authors are only interested in defining a term, comparing and contrasting two ideas, describing an experience or event, or simply amusing or shocking readers. The different forms that writing might take and the purposes such writing might serve are so numerous that it would be impossible to list all of them. Not only are the forms of discourse numerous, but it is also frequently difficult to decide which ones are actually present in a text. Authors rarely begin a work by announcing their purpose and describing their method. Authors do not proclaim at every point that they are presenting an argument. They do not label each and every sentence they write as either a premise or a conclusion. Here are six rules for identifying premises and conclusions. Rule one, we do not identify premises and conclusions by content. Rule two, we do not identify premises and conclusions by position or location within a paragraph. For stylistic or other reasons, the premises and the conclusions can appear anywhere. Rule three, the appearance of the following word or words at the beginning of a sentence or clause signifies that the sentence or clause is a conclusion. The key words are, therefore, thus, so, hence, consequently, accordingly, it follows that, as a result, I conclude, and synonymous terms. The following argument provides an example. Argument one, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Rule four, the appearance of the following word or words at the beginning of a sentence or clause signifies that the sentence or clause is a premise. The clue words are since, for, because, whereas, as, inasmuch as, seeing that, and synonymous terms. For example, since Mr. Rivera is an alien, and because no aliens can vote in U.S. elections, we must conclude that Mr. Rivera cannot vote in the next election. The words since and because alert us to the fact that what follows is a premise. There is another common pattern found in arguments. Often we find two sentences or clauses flanking the word for or because. When this pattern appears, it means that what precedes the word for or because is a conclusion and what follows the word for or because is one or more premises. Rule five, supply implicit or missing premises and conclusions. Many times an argument is so clear from its context that the author provides only part of it. In these cases, it is up to the reader to supply the missing or assumed premises or even the conclusion. Consider the following example. Mr. Wong is an illegal alien, so he is not permitted to vote. We can identify the part of the sentence following so as the conclusion. The first part is a premise. However, there is another obvious premise that is not stated, namely that illegal aliens are not permitted to vote. The complete argument now looks like this. Premise, illegal aliens are not permitted to vote. This is supplied by the reader. Premise two, Mr. Wong is an illegal alien. Conclusion, Mr. Wong is not permitted to vote. Rule six, any proposition may be both a premise and a conclusion when there is more than one argument in the same passage. A set of interlocking arguments is called a sorites. The conclusion to one argument may be the premise to the second argument. Presenting your case. In presenting your case to other people, there are several general considerations that must be kept in mind. First, you must have a clear idea of just what your case, issue, or point of view is. 
Second, you must be aware of the relation of your position on this case or issue to your position on other issues. The reason for this is obvious. You do not want to present your case on one issue in such a way that it might cause conflicts or future embarrassments when you present your position on another issue. Third, you should have some clear idea of the audience to whom you are presenting your case. Are they people who already share your opinion? Are they undecided? Or are they likely to be unreceptive or openly hostile? No doubt your audience may consist of any combination of the foregoing possibilities. Different audiences will require different approaches. Fourth, you must understand the medium you are using to convey your case. Are you speaking directly to the people? Or are you writing an article for a newspaper, magazine, scholarly journal, or the like? Are you preparing an advertisement that will be visually presented for a few moments? Finally, you must constantly keep in the forefront of your mind the purpose for which you are presenting your case. If you are a rational teacher trying to present an objective case, you will do one thing, like considering the shortcomings of your position. And if you are trying to get people to buy a product, you will do something else, like pretending that there are no weaknesses in your product. The last point is worth dwelling upon. If you know what you want to achieve, your purpose, and if you know the people with whom you want to achieve your end, your audience, and the means available to you, the medium, then you will be better able to achieve your end. No doubt, there are all kinds of clever and brilliant things you might do, but it is easier that some of these clever and brilliant things may be irrelevant, in which case they may detract attention from your main purpose or even be counterproductive. If you remember that the important thing is winning, then you are not likely to go off in all directions at once. Analogously, there is no reason for leading a dazzling and disastrous cavalry charge when a simple artillery barrage will do the job. The presentation of your case should be given in three parts. Arousing sympathy for your cause, presenting facts, or what will be taken as facts to substantiate your case, and driving home the conclusion. Part of the reason for the complexity of arguments is that audiences are not monolithic. That is, in presenting a case, we have to appeal to people whose interests are not uniform. There are at least six different types of audiences from the point of view of audience interest. First, the audience may consist of people who agree with your end or ultimate goal. Second, the audience may consist of people who agree both with your end or ultimate goal and with the means you are suggesting for reaching it. Third, the audience may consist of people who agree with your end, but only as a means to some other end that they do not share with you. What is an end for you, therefore, may be a means for them. Fourth, the audience may consist of people who agree with your means, but seek thereby to achieve different ends. In other words, what you have in common is means, but not ends. Fifth, there are, of course, combinations of the above, where some of the audience agree on the end and some agree only on your end is a means to their somewhat different goals. This is a combination of one and two above. There are complex audiences wherein an end for you is a means to them, but the additional end they foresee is an acceptable end for you as well. This is a combination of three and four. Hence, you must argue for something as both a means and an ultimate end at the same time. Gaining a sympathetic audience. Considering the complexity of your potential audience, the notion that one can engage in argumentation simply by launching into the presentation of information is a foolish one. No discussion and certainly no argument can exist in a vacuum. Everyone, including the speaker and the audience, has a frame of reference in terms of which he speaks and to which he implicitly or explicitly appeals. It is essential that you keep this frame of reference in mind when presenting your case. If you want to prepare the audience for the presentation of your point of view, and to gain a sympathetic hearing as well, then appeal to the common frame of reference that you share with the audience. The appeal to pity. To appeal to pity is to appeal to the emotions of your audience, emotions that you expect to be favorably directed to your cause. The most effective use of the appeal to pity does not involve the use of highly emotive and inflammatory language. Rather, it relies upon the bare presentation of simple and unchallengeable facts. It is important that this appeal not be overdone so that members of the audience are not unnecessarily antagonized. This is especially true when the audience is not well known to you or when they are still undecided about the issue raised. There are many examples of the presentation of an argument that begin 
with an appeal to 